So it must have been quite a shock when you found out that you were diagnosed with, with tuberculosis. How did, how would you, um, how was it found? Well, um, yeah, we don't have any screening in place, so mm -hmm. I actually just developed a dry cough and uh, I thought it was sinusitis because it was just after the pollen season and I usually get a bit of an irritation in the throat. And a colleague of mine at work actually told me, she said, I hear you have a dry cough, uh, I think you should go and get an extra. And I asked, asked her, but why? I don't feel ill. Um, and she said, well, she had a dry cough and it turned out to be cavitating TB. And she's also a doctor. And she said, well, recently a, a good friend of hers, um, that's also a doctor working in South Africa, she developed headaches and um, she also developed some dizziness so she went to see a neurologist and she had a completely normal neurological exam but they decided to do a CT scan and then on the CT scan it showed partial brain herniation from TB meningitis so when I heard this story I was really quite scared so um, I because I'm a doctor I just went for an x-ray myself um, and it was my first x-ray of chest x-ray of my life and I got the fright of my life because I had a large cavity in my left upper lobe. It was a thick walled cavity, but it was about three centimeters in size. And um, it was clearly tuberculosis in the setting that I'm coming from. Um, I then imme immediately went to the occupational health clinic at my hospital. And there are only nurses working there, so I had to ask to see the occupational health specialist, which at that stage just suggested that I start empiric TB treatment. And I was quite concerned because I didn't have a productive cough and I wanted to find the organism because I know I've I had exposure to MDR and XLTB patients and I wanted to start the correct treatment as soon as possible. So I then went um, to a private pulmonologist and he suggested a CT with a bronchoscopy that I then had. And luckily then within 48 hours I had the correct diagnosis. I could start the correct treatment but this was done on private medical aid and um, also not in the system that's currently in place for healthcare workers. Um, so yes, that was the, the diagnosis. And mm -hmm. then the treatment started, which was also quite brutal, as you've heard. With the, uh, injections? With injections and lots of side effects. And then I was unlucky, I was one of the people that developed hearing loss. Um, we monitored my hearing very frequently because I was concerned about this and I started developing hearing loss at two months of therapy um, and I discussed options with the physician treating me at that stage, discussed uh, lowering of the dose and he said no, uh, discussed surgery to try and cut out the lesion because it was just in one lesion in my chest, he said no, not for first time TB discussed other options of treatment and he said no. So um, I was faced with the question, well, why am I measuring my hearing loss if there's no alternatives? And also, as a clinician, I, um, especially in South Africa, we use our stethoscopes and we rely on our stethoscopes quite often. And if you can't use your stethoscope, then you can't practice as a doctor. And at this stage, I also had contact with an occupational health nurse at the clinic I was going to, and she had MDR-TB, and she went deaf overnight after two months of therapy. And she then got bilateral cochlear implants, but she told me she's unable to use a stethoscope to measure blood pressure. Um, she said she's unable to listen to music, because it sounds like tin. And she said she also struggles to hear over the telephone. So really has a dramatic effect on your hearing and you can't fall back onto cochlear implants to try and get some yes it works for normal conversation but uh, it's not uh, having just your hearing back so it is one of the terrible irreversible side effects that you get from MDR TV treatment so at this stage uh, we tried some alternatives and we heard about bedaquilin which is a new drug and um, at this stage also I had shown good response to treatment. I was already culture negative after two weeks of therapy. Um, the lesion in my lung collapsed and I only had fibrovascular scarring left. Um, and we had some hope of getting this new drug. 
on compassionate use. Um, so then at two and a half months, my hearing deteriorated even further. And it was uh, a constant stress. Uh, when would be the day that I would just completely lose the hearing? So then my physician said, okay, let's stop the um, intravenous therapy now and um, we see if we can get the bidacrylin. And then I was one of the lucky people that during a short window period that the compassionate use program was open could get this drug. So I started the drug, I took it for six months and I was very lucky and very grateful because I think it had a huge impa an impact on, um, on my treatment regime. And um, mm. yes, I've now, now been, it's now been almost two years and um, I've completed the treatment mm. and I've remained culture negative. My x-rays uh, remained um, unchanged only with the scarring left and I'm able to practice as a doctor again. Mm. I can use my stethoscope. Um, the high frequency hearing loss I have doesn't affect my normal daily functioning. So, yeah. so that is great. But uh, there's a lot of sad stories out there. A lot of people in my country suffering. Yeah. A lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers. Um, and, and unfortunately, they closed the compassionate use program. So now we have a problem of professionals getting ill and losing their ability to practice. Um, and this is, this is a real problem. Hmm. Is there some hope that they'll reopen this compassionate use? There is hope, but mm -hmm. at the moment um, there's been a struggle, with, mm -hmm. uh, especially from the MSF side, that really pushed for the use of mm -hmm. this drug. But um, it's yeah. been over a year now and they have no mm -hmm. uh, luck. The Medical mm. Control Council say that uh, there's some possibility if they do it in a clinical trial environment that they will make this drug yeah. available again. But, um, mm. And the drug is due for FDA approval mm -hmm. and we hope that the drug will be available mm -hmm. um, soon because it's really needed soon. And what, how do you see it now? How do you look at TB? You, look, you were aware of TB before, mm -hmm. yes. but now having suffered it, um, what is it like? How do you see the disease now? And I'm sort of curious: Did you encounter what many patients encounter, which is stigma? Um, I'm sure there's stigma, mm -hmm. but um, from the start, I I thought about it, and uh, for me, uh, I'm not uh, scared of the stigma. I decided to go public with it, and uh, because I, I know it's very common, especially in healthcare workers, about 10% of my medical class have had TB. So um, I think uh, we're starting to see less stigma in South Africa. Um, so um, I think uh, it's because more people are speaking up and saying, well, this is a real problem. Um, I'm a healthy individual. I'm a HIV negative. I don't smoke. I live a healthy lifestyle. I'm just a healthcare uh, practitioner and I've got a high exposure to TB so um, yes I will get TB if I'm exposed to it on an everyday basis and I don't have protection and that is our main problem in South Africa there's no protection for stuff there's no masks available um, there's no environmental control and there's a high load of patients so we work under very stressful um, conditions so yes I decided to go public and I've got uh, friends that also we actually want to get the media involved so that we can try and push for change quicker rather than staying quiet and then just accepting the problem as it is. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be proactive, uh, trying to um, in a way also reduce stigma by making it public. Um, and uh, But yes, stigma is still a problem because um, there, there is still, uh, I think, a, Especially amongst some people, they still think, well, if you're a healthy individual, you won't get TB. Um, but we know now that that is not the case. Anyone can get TB. Um, we've had top athletes getting TB. So um, it, it really depends on your exposure to, the, to this bacteria. Um, so, yes. Do you hope, uh, if you, uh, do you have any... Um, a uh, request that you would make, or any, if you had to, uh, something you would want to say to healthcare professionals, other doctors, um, now having suffered TB, uh, what would that be? Well, um, 
I would encourage them to report it and to because um, what usually happens, what I've seen in the past, um, people don't disclose. They don't even go to the occupational health uh, clinic at their facility uh, because of stigma and because of their fear of future work opportunities and um, also the influence on their practice uh, because they might think, oh, they're a doctor that has TB, maybe patients wouldn't want to come and see me. Um, but I would encourage them to disclose so that we can um, actually uh, make other people aware that we are a vulnerable group in this fight against TB because we are the ones that have the high exposure rate to TB. Um, so that we can support those that get infected with the disease and that we can also push for change. Um, I think that's the only way that we're going to have the get the authorities' attention and get some funding for protection of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, I've found, especially when I completed the MDR TB regime, it's a very brutal regime and it's it's uh, very difficult to go through. And um, when I completed the treatment, I just wanted to forget about TB. I wanted to uh, just focus on anything else and put this behind me and go on with my life. But then after a while I realized that this thing happened for a reason it, and I must try and turn this negative experience into something positive. Um, and um, for that reason um, I decided to go public with this and try and then support these large amount of people that struggle with this disease that's still in uh, uh, in sort of captivity and they, they need to still struggle through the treatment, they're struggling with a lot of things and to provide support to them and also to uh, mobilize change. Um, so try and turn this negative experience into something positive. Um, and I think I would really encourage TB patients to, to try and focus on that. Um, not see it as something negative. Yes, it is. It's very terrible, but we must try and use that negative experience to try and uh, do something about it and try and uh, make a positive effect. And I found that it actually improves your mood. It improves the the um, depression that you sometimes struggle with um, after this disease and the stigma. It improves that, and you actually become more positive, more optimistic, um, and you, you see it as a more of a challenge um, than a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And I think any TB survivor is such a, uh, a champion, so I think it, it's actually, uh, we need the champions to speak up and say that there's life after TB, anyone, it's a curable disease and um, anyone can get TB. So if you're a TB survivor, that's great. Mm. And so, and you're using Facebook to spread yes. the word. Yes, so we've created a Facebook page, TB Proof, uh, where we try to support TB patients, occupational health specialist exposure to TB, and we just try and um, get people involved. So if you want to post something on it, you're welcome. If you want to ask questions, you're welcome. I mean, that way we try to uh, provide support and, and try to raise awareness about this disease. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you.